The Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction event, which ended the Mesozoic era of the dinosaurs and began the Cenozoic era of mammals, is often depicted as if tiny shrew-like animals were the only ones that survived. But mammals had already diversified a bit before that earth-shattering cataclysm, and they were more surviving lineages than you might be aware of. And while the vast majority of vertebrate and invertebrate species were wiped out all at once, including nearly everything reptilian, there were still some lizards and crocodilians, a few different amphibians, and two lineages of birds, which were the only dinosaurs remaining, and from which every order and family of modern birds are derived. It's the same with mammals, but there wasn't just one lineage left. There were a couple of monotremes, a few metatherians, and several lines of eutherians. Although all eutherian mammals started out looking like this, and a few still look like that today, the rest were already noticeably different way back when. This is an estimate based on the atomic clock, showing when genomic sequence comparisons indicate that different clades of eutherian mammals diverged. And this genetic chart is pretty well reflected in the fossil record too. This red dotted vertical line represents the KT impact. As you can see here, there were already a few primitive shrews, moles, hedgehogs, pangolins, rodents, lagomorphs, sloths, and armadillos. None of them the same species that we have today. These are just their visibly similar Paleocene ancestors, and they've changed quite a bit since then. The other fauna around at that time wouldn't be familiar at all. Other lines on this chart that haven't diverged by this point represent lineages that still have surviving descendants today, but that looked very different then than they do now. And we still had a few things then that we don't have anymore, too. Much more ancient mammals like multituberculates and simulestids that originated as far back as the Jurassic and even survived the most spectacular mass extinction in Earth's history, the longest lasting mammals ever, but they still didn't persist long enough for any human to see them alive. And then there were new things, new branches on the Eutherian family tree, some of which didn't last very long at all, but the Paleocene period was a prolific explosion of mammalian diversity nonetheless. At the point of the KT impact, the largest Eutherians were only about as big as dogs, but the demise of the dinosaurs left a virtually vacant field for a new league of players. No longer having to sneak around in the dark, they came out of the underground literally living large. And fast forward 20 million years or so, and we see several mammalian orders all flowering at once, and each producing uniquely distinct lines. But we can't talk about all of these things at once, even though there's all this diversification going on right at the same time. So we'll feature a few different sets of some of the most interesting of these developments in each of the next few episodes of the series as they continue to evolve. The shape of the world in the Middle Eocene looks pretty familiar, except that Europe is mostly underwater. The subcontinent of India has been an island since the breakup of Pangaea and has been moving north ever since, but it has just crashed into the Eurasian continental plate. And this ongoing collision is still pushing up the Himalayas a couple inches a year, even in our time. So seashells that were once on the sea floor have been and still are being shoved skyward as tectonic plates crumple in the slow motion crunch. And back then, for no intelligible reason at all, a number of different mammal lineages had independently developed hooves, which is like if your toenails grew really ridiculously thick, so thick that you had to walk on the nails instead of on the toes themselves. In Africa, you had the first proboscideans with these really big, thick toenails. In North America through Asia, which were just breaking apart from the supercontinent of Laurasia, were the first perissodactyls represented by Phenacotus, which is part of the ancestry of both horses and rhinos, among other things that will come up later. But it's also karyotypic of the ancestor of carnivorans, meaning that it looks like it, in that it's generalized in, in an undifferentiated form that could go either way. And we know these three orders began very close together genetically as well as geographically. The first artiodactyls also appeared in Laurasia, represented here by Diacodexus. It's just like a deer with too many toes, because everything started with five toes. Elephants still have five toes, plus a sixth pseudodigit that you can't see because it's deep inside their foot. Others, like Diacodexus, lost their thumb toe, going down to four, making them even-toed ungulates, or artiodactyls, while perissodactyls, like Phenacotus, dropped two toes at least, making them odd-toed ungulates, perissodactyls, and of course horses eventually dropped all the way down to one. And for right now, at this point in the Middle Eocene period, it seems that the most interesting place in the world is South America, where there is another group of hooved animals, or ungulates, called Meridia ungulata, that are unlike anything else in the world, and they don't have any living descendants. 
They're about the size of hippos and look like very large tapers, except that they have five toes like elephants and even look a bit like small elephants, except that their four tusks are formed out of canines, where elephant tusks are made out of overgrown incisors. So these things could use their tusks above and below for a very powerful bite in self-defense. And there were several species of these ponderous beasts wandering around South America and Antarctica. Yes, Antarctica. Because the world had been unusually hot prior to this due to an as yet unexplained rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, which raised the global average temperature by 8 degrees Celsius and melted all the ice at the poles. And it took a long time to recover from that. So while the heat was insufferable elsewhere in the world, we have these seemingly tropical hippo-sized pseudo-elephants living in Antarctica of all places. And there were already penguins there too, though again, not like what we have today. They were much bigger. And one of them is called Anthropornis, has stood 5 foot 11 inches tall. Quite a stout penguin. And the flying seabirds that patrolled the coast there were bigger too. Osteodornis looked like a giant albatross with a 20 foot wingspan, and it had sharp bony teeth. Not actual rooted teeth, not proper teeth. It's related to pelicans and storks, which are toothless. But it grew these bony serrations in its jaw to serve as rather vicious teeth for holding on to fish. And some other South American birds had grown so big that they were even taller than most people. So they were obviously too big to fly. But they could kick with such force that they could easily kill any time-traveling human with one reflexive move. And they were carnivorous hunters who could run down pretty much anything alive at that time. Thus, they became the top predators on the continent. However, even as big and as fierce as these terror birds were, it would have been hard to take down one of those hippophants because they were 10 feet long. They were the biggest mammals on the continent. But there was something else that was even bigger. Titanoboa is the largest snake known to man a relative of the anaconda, but twice as long as the biggest python alive today, somewhere between 40 and 50 feet long. And its coils were about three feet thick. It could eat a hippophant or a terror bird. And most things were small enough that it didn't even need to squeeze. It would just bite you and swallow you. Quick as that, clean and easy. And Titanoboa shared the swamps with a giant snapping turtle too. Carbonamis was 10 feet long and weighed about a ton. So if it snapped you, it could eat you. And fortunately, our ancestry didn't start in South America, or it might not have started at all. A few years ago, news media made a big deal about the discovery of a beautifully preserved fossil of Darwinius Massillae, nicknamed Ida. A lot of reporters sensationalized this story, saying that Ida was a direct ancestor of humanity, but that's not the case. She was an important transitional species, but not to us. She represents a transition from the most primitive primates to modern Libras, which have some skeletal differences from the earlier and even more primitive primates. She also had characteristics of both of the earliest branches of the primate family tree. That's Strepsirini, lemurs and lorises on one side, and haplorines, which account for every other modern primate species. Ida was found in what is now Germany from 47 million years ago. At that time, our ancestors, yours, mine, and everyone's, was apparently in Asia. This is Teilhardina asiatica, the earliest known haplorine primate from about the same time as Ida. The difference between strepsirines and haplorines comes down to one distinguishing feature. Strepsirines are the most primitive primates, having smaller brains than haplorines. The definitive characteristic is that lemurs and lorises have wet noses, like a dog has, like a lot of mammals do. It helps them to detect scent in the air, but haplorines are more dependent on visual acuity and have lost much of their ability to smell things. They also have a smaller olfactory lobe and a dry nose. So, if you accept that you are a primate, there's only two types of primates you can be. So you must realize that if you have a dry nose, that makes you haplorine. I mean, sometimes if you get the sniffles, it might seem like your nose is wet, but it's not. <laughs> 